All right, welcome to another episode of New Wine Uncorked, and I am stoked to be uh, this week with uh, my uh, compatriots and my counterparts, uh, Tony and Phil. Uh, everyone, you'll notice that uh, last week we had uh, um, our take on our New Wine Uncorked uh, stepped into the realm of bullying um, with Paul, and that was an amazing conversation. It was interesting and ironic last week that both uh, Phil and Tony had things come up and dealing with church life, you know, and the thing that we're talking about and we've been continually talking about is this kingdom ethics or kingdom economics and the economics of the kingdom of God and the economics of the kingdom of this world and how those then uh, filter into and somewhat overwhelm the church. And so we're what, 13 days or so out of uh uh, so, yeah, about 13 days out of the election, and there's just been a whirlwind of folks getting involved at so many different levels. And so here on New Wine on Court, we want to continue this discussion. We want to continue uh, what we're talking about with uh, what is the kingdom in relation to the church and what is the kingdom in relation to the world. And so if you've been joining us and following us on New Wine on Court, you'll know that We've been talking about loyalty. The last one that the three of us got together was the purity of heart. And so if the church is to will one thing, what is that one thing that we would be willing? And in both of your context, uh, especially like the last time we talked, Phil, you were talking about uh, some of the the protesting that was going on in Portland and uh, your buddies, uh, the Proud Boys were there um, and they were there, uh, I guess, celebrating the joy of whatever they celebrate, right? So, and so how does the kingdom respond to this? What are the economics uh, and, and the, the ethics and the mentality of the kingdom of God and compared to the kingdom of this world? And then what are we seeing now with COVID-19, social injustice? Like, is this this uh, coming together that has been there all along and for some reason now is finally manifesting itself? Or are we in a different time where it is finally hitting a point um, that we've never seen before? I don't know what your guys' take on that is. Yeah, definitely not a thing that um, is coming together different. I think it's definitely something that's more been under the surface that we just haven't, that we may and just haven't looked at. I mean, we're noticing now, I mean, there's so many things where it comes to just um, just different people with uh, people of color that have different stories. And we're finally just paying attention to some, some of those stories. Not everybody, but many of us are just kind of being aware of those stories, but in the same fashion, um, just kind of the notion of white supremacy and those kind of things and just how evasive that kind of stuff is, has been, you know, has always been around, but we just haven't kind of paid attention to it. And now, um, you know, it's, it's, it's rolled into, it's rolled into some major city <laughs> and been, you know, wandered outside with, with khaki pants and tiki torches. Right. So, um, so it's not necessarily something that, that hasn't been, it's not brand new, but it's something that's been around, um, but yeah, for me, it has been just a shock that um, that I, I could find a brother and sister in Christ of mine, you know, wandering around. That's something that I never thought I would see. Um, and it's, uh, it's pretty scary, even if they, you know, went for all the stuff or read all the, you know, the books that, that have been out there, um, whether we're talking about New Jim Crow or Tiny Coach, even if they're not aware of those kind of things. To stand on the same side with those kind of brothers, I, I, I would be, it has thrown me off. So yeah, that's where I stand there. Yeah, I think the um, where where I'm sitting, the irony was I think po or pre 2016 election, there was this um, thick blanket of civility or niceness that kind of uh, coated and flattened the tension um, within American Christianity or evangelicalism at large. And so we never really talked about um, what forces kept us apart or kept us divided. Uh, we, we all operated under the status quo and we pursued a quote unquote Christian unity, John 17 unity. Um, but then come uh, the election and then it became clear that 81 percent of white evangelicals voted for Trump. I think people people of color 
um, black people and uh, left leaning evangelicals or left leaning Christians uh, were shocked and astonished that their so-called brothers and sisters could support and not only support, but enthusiastically uh, uh, throw their support behind a, a man that threatened the people that they called brothers and sisters. There's the shock and dismay. But I think the way that evangelicalism moves and morphs and is so nimble that you can't really place it culturally because it'll adapt to be a uh, to survive where we're at now in 2020 is uh there's an inverse effect i i think maybe it could um be boiled down to um a victim mentality but i where in 2016 i was so surprised by my brothers and sisters who supported trump and still said they were christian the inverse has taken place where now brothers and sisters who I go to church with are surprised and shocked that I don't support Trump and I support Black Lives Matter. And there's this, this nimbleness that evangelicalism has taken on. And so just recently, uh, and, and I mentioned this to you guys uh, before we started recording, but recently I had somebody at my church who uh, called me into a very important meeting and they wanted to ask me the implications of my support for Black Lives Matter. Um, and they said, because Tony, if you support Black Lives Matter, you are a Marxist, you're a socialist, uh, you want to destroy the nuclear family and so forth. And they listed off this litany of charges and accusations. And I think that that's pertinent to our conversation today about a kingdom ethic, because uh, when, when I'm being accused of being a socialist or so forth, I don't think that person really knows what socialism is or what Marxism really is. I think in part of the nimbleness and the flexibility of evangelicalism, evangelicalism will always be able to paint uh, caricatures of its supposed enemies and it will always move the definition or the target of its enemies so that it can stay relevant. So it's it, there is no substance to the very thing that evangelicalism or American evangelicalism stands against. And so when I'm being charged with being a Marxist or socialist, what I find interesting is that in a kingdom ethic, my conviction as um, a follower of Jesus and as a pastor is that whatever economic system I subscribe to it has to value the human body. And so the human body is not a resource. It is not a material. It is not a, um, a source of profit. And so whatever kingdom ethic or uh, economic system that I subscribe to, it has to value the human body and not use it as a resource. And so if that labels me as a socialist, great. Uh, I, I will own that label. Um, and I will follow Karl Barth down that rabbit hole. Um, and so that's where I find the, the complexities of, of uh, evangelicalism, white American evangelicalism, so, so interesting and so fascinating because of how nimble it is and how flexible it is. And then the irony of now brothers and sisters in Christ being so surprised that uh, I would support Black Lives Matter and so forth. And so, yeah, I, I wonder if I can try to misappropriate the term proud boys and use it for something else, but we'll see. Yeah, it- well, One more thing, oh, come on, one more thing, Cody, in connection to what you just said. Um, I, I'm just thinking that, you know, when someone kind of um, stacks all those charges on you because you're associated yourself with Black Lives Matter, how come like, when you say, well, you support Trump, then you don't stack the same charges on them saying, because you support Trump, then you must support this, you must support this, you must support that, rather than just being, well, I like some of his policies that he's for, and he's against abortion and the like. How can I say, well, I'm against anti-racism, I'm against racism, therefore, um, I stand with Black Lives Matter. Like, how come we can't just, how come I have to take the whole enchilada if I'm, if I'm marching in this particular way, so. 
No, and, and I'm with you because my my response to that charge was, okay, sure, from your perspective and position, Jesus isn't a socialist. But that doesn't mean Jesus is a capitalist either. Um, you, you, We have to be consistent then. If you're saying, man, socialism is an anti-Christian, anti-God uh, economic system, that does not equal that Jesus is a capitalist. Like, the, the, there's a flattening of nuance and complexity. And I think that's what we're struggling with is, is uh, working on a set of agreed upon terms because one camp uh, always changes the terms of agreement and always changes definitions. Uh, you could say they are relative. Yeah, I, I think, it, and it, the reality is because it's funny that, uh, I mean, I don't know if it's funny or intriguing or what, but that you uh, got a chance to go through that experience yesterday, uh, day before and, and such in your church, Tony. And in, in one of my classes today, as I was explaining to you both uh, earlier, I had made the comment about allegiance because we were talking about loyalty. And again, uh, I said that uh, for we have to get away from this idea of American Christianity that our loyalty and allegiance first and foremost is to America and then to the God of America because uh, I was talking about I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States and I said it's still a pledge of allegiance to a flag a material thing and it's of this country under this God who is so ambiguous that we don't even know the God's name it's uh, what Col Colin Gunton called the the unnamed deities of each age you know so that within the evangelical church you actually have people who could be a supporter of Trump and a supporter of Biden and we're not even talking about why like I would love it if the Christian scientists, doctors and such would get together so we could have a robust dialogue as to scientifically and medically, what does it say when a human life starts so that we can even get that? Because my concern is, is that when the evangelical church starts to legislate righteous behavior, i.e. Supreme Court justices to then take up these accounts of whether or not marriage is illegitimate between a man and a man, or whether or not a female now is a murderer, depending on uh, her choice. And the same thing with a doctor is their choice to participate in that. Are they murderers? You know, could we not have a robust dialogue that says here's scientifically and medically what the medical doctors and everyone believes that the start of life is religiously faith-based organizations, faith-based groups, the uh, Muslims, the Mormons, the Jehovah Witness, getting together and say, here's why we believe life begins here or even begins. In the but we're not even having those dialogues because it's like we're so afraid, like with what you experienced today in, or this week in your church, is same thing with my classroom is we are so afraid of conf confrontation that the truth of life is it's dialectic. It has to be, there has to be tension and confrontation in all that we do if we are really robustly interacting with each other. Because the moment I step into your life, Tony, and I want to go this way, I am in opposition of you if you were like, well, I was thinking this other way. Like I wanted to go left and you were, you came in, we're participating together. And now you want to go right. That is in direct opposition of it's dialectic. And yet it's necessary sometimes because then you might not have known that the path going right leads to this greater uh, uh, expanse, but because you were willing to dialogue with me, we were willing to have that confrontation, right? Today, the confrontation is nil. We just walk away. I watch these, uh, and because we see it play out in front of us, politicians, if they don't want to have that dis difficult discussion, they walk away. How is it that you support uh, President Trump? And he said, uh, if you choose Biden, he is going to side with the scientist when he's dealing like that's what he said so how can we not have a how can we even understand if i believe uh biden or i believe trump if we as christians aren't even willing to have these robust dialogues you know instead it's just from these church leaders if you don't believe this then you are this that's not the jesus way absolutely and, and the same token and 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 this kind of connects to something that, that you mentioned a moment ago, Tony, and, and it gets a bit more in what you mentioned, Matt, is um, 
it just kind of demonstrates how much we don't know when it comes to the gospel when it comes to being a follower of Jesus Christ, what does that entail? If we can maneuver it to fit anything, then it, it just doesn't seem to be anything. <laughs> it, seems to be too, it seems to be way too flexible to be, to be something that I want to actually land my life on. And so, and so I mean, that, that may connect to just the notion that, you know, we have, you know, fewer people wanting to, wanting to be a part of this movement of Christianity, continuing this movement of Christianity, because we just don't seem to stand for anything. And um, that, 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 just thinking about this whole conversation, that's probably the most scary thing to me, is that if we're, if we're not standing for anything, what, what are we doing, you know? Yeah. Uh, to, to move uh, the conversation in kind of a niche uh, direction, but I think that is uh, crucial, of crucial importance for us, um, because it, it brings us up uh, further stream to investigate what's polluting the waters. I think in Christian um, language and Christian theology, Christian thinking, uh, today I was reading um, Robert Jensen's uh, first volume of his two volume uh, systematic theology. And so Jensen was just talking about how in Western theology, especially contemporary Western theology, there is this tendency um, to place authority on uh, the content of our thinking before we explore the truth of the content of which we talk about. Um, I guess in simpler terms or anecdotally, we, we take that it is a given as American Christians, American evangelicals take as a given that the United States of America is a Christian nation. Therefore, one nation under God means the United States is a nation under God. So that's the reliability or the authority of the content that's imposed upon us that the United States is a nation under God, and that's the authority. We never question the content, though, and to your point, Matt, whether or not that God, the God of the United States of America, and to use Jensen's language, is the same God as the God who raised Christ from the dead and who raised Israel from slavery and captivity in Egypt. We never question the content. And so I think going further upstream, we see that trickle down to us today in the way that American evangelicals talk about theology. And not only that, but their cognitive dissonance and how they don't see their theology um, has import into their politics and their morality. Because it just, it boggles my mind um, the numerous conversations I've had with conservative evangelicals, politically conservative uh, evangelicals who say, um, God isn't concerned with politics. Um, so I don't really uh, allow my faith to determine my politics. But then what we've seen is they vote the way they vote because of their faith. And so there's, there's this disconnect almost as if they don't want their politics to soil their faith because they're pragmatic, but now they've gotten so far in that there's no longer a need or a desire to keep up the facade. Because now the truth is, um, I will do whatever it takes to protect myself and, and my own. And um, if, if it comes at the cost of my reputation, so be it, or my public witness, so be it, because I already believe that I am a marginalized, oppressed uh, community, and I'm going to live into that victim mentality. And, and so we net what, what I think Jensen correctly critiques Western theology. We place so much uh, authority on the content before we question the truthfulness of the content or the reliability of the content. Yeah, sure, America can be one nation under God, but which God? 
that's where we need to move the conversation forward. I think if there's any hope of um, the church reforming its public witness. How then the, does the church do that? Because we talked about this, like this never contending with what Nietzsche talked about or even Dostoevsky, this death of God, you know? And so it seems like in the 21st century, we're rebuilding our idea of who God is. And it continues to be a God in the projection of the 21st century church. And so to your point, Tony, that uh, people were asking you to basically, they're they asking you loyalty questions. You know, are you with this group of people? Are you with this? I'm curious though, Phil, does that happen um, in a, a, a black church where they ask you your loyalty? So for instance, you, you hanging out with, you know, folks from Multnomah, they're going, Hey bro, why didn't, you know, Multnomah, like that's a, a white seminary kind of thing, you know, or it came from a dispensational, which tended to be from the South, you know, and much more of a white theology. Like, so do you get the same pushback though? It, my family pushes back, same thing, and my my church and, and some of the folks around me in my life will push back exactly what Tony got. Like, well, are you with this movement, the Black Lives Matter? Are you with, like, this political? And then it, it, it gets used to judge me in our context. I'm curious to know, same within your church context, though, do you find that same thing happening, uh, Phil, with this push towards social justice? But it might be that we're all fighting within our own people groups to where we can't even then get to the broader sense of unity. Yeah, um, definitely at one point in my in, in just academic career, yeah, that was a question and that was a concern. Um, and it was far less like political allegiance or anything like that. It was more along the lines of, am I more academic or more spirit led kind of thing? Um, and that was the, and that was the more of the conversation. When it comes to now, I don't I don't see that as much of a conversation. Um, there was at least a part where we were talking about being evangelical. What is that? Is that even a part? I'm a Christian. What does that mean? <laughs> being evangelical and then seeing what it, you know, where our allegiances maybe lot, you know, where where our allegiances were if we kind of claim to be evangelical. There was that a little bit, but it wasn't necessarily something along the lines of political or anything along those lines. Um, but it was more it was more along the lines of if are you still following the Holy Spirit kind of thing or are you learning your theology from a book and it's not it's just moving away from the spirit of God. So, yeah, that's where I have my conversation for. Yeah, and I think I, I'm wondering if if you guys uh, uh, in, in so generationally. Uh, do do we find that kingdom ethics and the, the economics of kingdom of God versus the kingdom of this world? Do you find that it is much more uh, acknowledged that there is a distinct difference um, the younger the person gets, that they can clearly see a demarcation between this world and, and Christ's kingdom, whereas the folks that are older, uh, at least in my experience, they're like, oh, well, God is God overall. And they just they, there's sort of this acknowledgement that I believe in God, so I can't be, and I'm talking in my context, the older uh, white folks that are at my church and even in my family, the older they are, they tend to be God fearing, but not willing to then acknowledge the wrongdoing of the, you know, the white people per specifically in the, the context I'm thinking of. But there's not a willingness to even engage other cultures because there's this idea that you're going to be polluted. You know, and so uh, let the the black culture have their black church. Let the Asian church have their own church setting. Let us be because uh, they bought into without really understanding it the homogenous. Oh, the churches must must be like mindedness, meaning not like minded because we're unified within the spirit of God, but like mindedness really meaning like looking that you look like me, and if you're a different color. The, the fact that you still have money, though, is means that you're more like me than others. So we're not going to let the color get into our uh, uh, relational truth. But if you didn't have money, well, then, uh, you know, and so it's a both and. But I find it generationally, at least, the younger I get, the more willingness to embrace foreign, you know, ideas or beliefs. And I don't know if you both have, have experienced that as well. 
Um, definitely, I, I've seen it generationally. Um, and that happened. this happened in many different spaces. The most recent one, I would say, um, has been um, there was a church that I knew that had to, that was pretty much expelled from a denomination um, because of their kind of allegiance to um, helping out LGBTQ um, families and um, marriage, supporting it and the like. Um, and this domination worked with them significant amount of time to try to under, try to help that church kind of work their perspective into what the denomination, but, you know, it kind of went on too long because the denomination was like, you know, that's enough. So um, what, what I did see happen in the backlash of that is there were some older churches that that was nothing to them. And they no, paid no mind to it. It's just something our denomination had to do, moved on to the next thing, had no conversation about it. The younger leaders within that denomination were all shaken because they were like, well, how can we say we're about loving, loving our brothers and those kind of things, and we're willing to do something like this? And um, it was it was very painful, so much so that there were leaders that there were younger leaders that left the denomination because of that. So so definitely along denominational lines, I mean, excuse me, along generational lines, because that that is the thing. But because we have built kind of so many things into what it means to be a believer, what it means to be part of the church, older and younger, that when we see something that comes contrary to that, it shakes our very foundation. So if you're an older Christian and a lot of these ideas that now are being brought up, that now are being talked about, um, they were just kind of part of what it meant to be a Christian. So when we rival it, we're rivaling faith and, and that's not necessarily the case. And we can see the distinction being younger or being new to this, is because we're like, hey, well, no, that has been separated from the gospel for a long time. We understand that we need various voices to articulate the gospel, and that has become a value to how we understand Christianity. And there's so much that I think one can learn from the other, but at the same token, and one of the values of New Wine that we continually talk about is the fact that we work through our differences. We work through our disagreements rather than working around them. And this is just a place where we brought up earlier that we'll just disconnect from the conversation and agree to disagree when we really need to run in, we really need to go through it and see the, and we'll actually see that our values are so very similar, they're just being expressed differently in a way that makes it seem like rivals, and we're really not rivals. So, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, such a complex um, context, like the variables at, at play, are, are so vast and so complex. I, I think when we look at the, the totality of scripture, I can't think of an instance in scripture where intergenerational unity is, um, is modeled well. Maybe like Paul and Timothy, um, but very rarely throughout the narrative of scripture do we see um, an older generation and a younger generation, like really find um, unity and, and mutual aid. Um, very rarely do we see uh, generational reconciliation. I think that's why there's something to be said about when God says, man, uh, like sin will affect subsequent generations. There's something to be said about generations inheriting things from previous generations. And so when we talk about the demarcations at gener generational lines or generational fissures, what, what I've found, so this is where intersectionality is important um, because it's not just an age thing, but it's also a socioeconomic thing. It's also a racial thing. All of these things complexify uh, our generational disagreements. The way I experience generational uh, tension or unity will be different than Matt or Phil. Um, and then the way we experience it as men is also different than the way that our sisters will experience it. I will say what I've found um, as a unique case study that I think will be determinative of the American church moving forward 
is um, it's often quoted by uh, a pastor, um, Brian Lortz, who now serves um, at like one of the flagship uh, SBC churches. Yep, with uh, J.D. Greer, Brian Lortz, uh, May Brian Lortz Jr. Um, but he, he recently was preaching at a, a local Portland church and he was just talking about how uh, the popular movement of white churches moving towards multicultural um, parody, multicultural uh, um, congregations. But what they saw, what studies, what sociologists and what miss missiologists saw is that once a white, predominantly white congregation moved towards racial or cultural parody and minorities reached a, a certain uh, percentage of the congregation, white people began to leave in droves. I think it was 30%. Once minorities within a predominantly white church reached 30%, white people began to leave in droves. So what that indicated was multicultural churches don't work in a white context. At least multicultural churches don't work for white churches. And so the new study that's being done that has yet to yield results is what does it look like for black churches and immigrant churches to be the birthing congregation or the birthing assembly where then uh, white people come and join that. And what does it look like when white people are never the majority? Will then multicultural churches be able to be birthed? Um, and we still don't have an answer for that, but uh, there is a hunch that if that isn't the answer, it will be birthed out of there though, because it comes back to, I think, uh, what we've always been discussing is, is power. A community who has always had power, who then has to give up power, struggles far more than a community who has never had power and then comes into power and now has to share power. Th there are two fundamental uh, distinctives there. So I think for, for the church in America, if we talk about generational disparity and generational demarcations, it is also tied with race. Because um, to be quite frank, I think white people experience generational uh, tension differently than colored people do. Um, and the way that colored people have had to navigate uh, generational tension is, is much more intrinsic to their identity than generational tension is intrinsic to the identity of white people. Because white people can just um, up and, and, a, and remove themselves from that generational tension. But when we talk about, uh, well, unless you're in the South, because then the Confederacy is, is tradition and ancestry. But um, I, I think for people of color, there's something to be said about our ancestors. There, there's, there's a tie there that gives people of color um, the relational tools necessary to navigate generational tension. And I see that you guys are smiling because I probably said something <laughs> that was like, oh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rest <laughs> right there. No, this is just a conversation I think me and you, I, I think the three of us will have going forward because um, within the church and outside of the church, those dynamics play out. And I know you can tell stories about how it played out. You, young Tony, becoming Minister Tony. Oh, and how that played out <laughs> and um, I could say I have stories as well um, so this this definitely a thing within the church though um, of yeah just the notion of how do you divest yourself of power that's the question how do you learn to live being poor that's a question when you're not poor how do you live poor when you're not poor like that's a question so uh, yeah that's something in the future I think we could we can get dive into yeah yeah and we will we'll continue this talk we 
for those of you that are watching and viewing, we totally appreciate it. As uh, always, place your comments right below. We'll have the the name of the pastor that uh, Tony, like every time we have this, you know, he mentions someone and we'll put that uh, name up there. The, go back and watch our, our one on reparations where he had the pastor from Philadelphia, man. It is freaking awesome. Um, but we'll put that one on, on uh, underneath this one as well. And we want to continue this conversation, talk about the power, talk about within the church and things, and then talk about this generational truth of the church. And next week, we'll continue with our kingdom ethics. And what does that look like in the midst of COVID-19, in the midst of the social unrest, and with this homogeneous or heterogeneous truth of the church? Well, which, how do we press into that so that we can be the unified bride that uh, Christ calls us to be. So again, we totally appreciate you joining us for this uh, discussion. Put your comments, your questions below uh, the video here on the YouTube page. Go up there and subscribe if you haven't already. And head over on Thursdays at 1 p.m. Pacific time to our Facebook page, New Wine, New Wineskins, for our live uh, Facebook chat that you can actually throw your comments up there in live time. Also, uh, in the next few Weeks, head on over to anchor.fm where you have new wineskins on a podcast so you can listen to the podcast on a daily basis. Uh, and we're going to even be moving into where even though the recordings are going up on YouTube, we're going to start to record these uh, live for a live podcast that you can participate in as well. So that's the upcoming but we want to step into this, like Phil and like Tony have said, these are issues that are in front of us that we have to embrace and have to dialogue about and have to deal with if we want to truly be uh, the people of God that we're called to be. So on behalf of my friends and my brothers, Tony and Phil, I'm Matt, and this has been another episode of New Wine and Corked. Until next week, see you on the flip side. <laughs>